It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Well, 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 it is Thanksgiving weekend, my friends. And uh, you might be kind of sucked into this whole holiday nonsense. Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday, all those things. Or you might actually care about what's going on with your financial life. One never knows. And if you've got a financial question, we would love to hear from you. Our email address is ask. Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And that is exactly what Jeff did. He is calling from Seattle. Hello, Jeff. Welcome to the program. What can I do for you? Well, I've got uh, uh, three or four uh, IRAs from Mm ex-employers, and I'm getting close to retirement age, so I'm thinking about I would like to make things a little bit easier and a little, you know, condense things down a little bit and okay. simplify my life. Yeah, it makes sense. So I'm kind of curious what 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 you would think would be the best way to go. So tell me what where are they um right now? Are they still in the old retirement accounts or you've rolled them over into IRAs and where and if so if they're rolled over where are they? Well, I've got one with Merrill Lynch. Uh, these are the big three. I've yep. got one with Merrill Lynch, one with Fidelity, and one with T. Rowe Price. Mm-hmm. And how are you investing right now? Are individual stocks, or do you have mutual funds, index funds? What's your pleasure? These are primarily mutual funds, and they're all uh, growth and income. These, uh-huh. the, the, the T. Rowe Price is probably, I don't know, 30 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, it, back then, it was all growth and income, mm-hmm. that's what I, you know, signed up for. You know, you're near retirement, but are you going to pull money out of these accounts anytime soon? Uh, no, I don't necessarily need to anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got some cash reserves, too, that I, I'm, I'm working off of. So I don't, I don't think I'll have to, and I guess it depends on, you know, your idea of how soon, uh, I'm thinking I probably don't need to start pulling anything out for four or five years. Oh, that's great. So when you have to, basically when you have the required minimum exactly. distributions. Okay. Have you claimed Social Security yet? No, I'm probably going to do that in the next uh, couple of months. I'm going to sign up. I'll be full retirement age. So my great. plan was to sign up then. So you can live on Social Security and the money that's in the cash reserves? For a certain amount of time, correct. Uh huh. How much money is in cash right now? I probably got two hundred and fifty thousand. Mm hmm. And the three IRAs total value, if you added them all up, about a million three. Okay. You own your own home? Yes, I do. Any mortgage outstanding? Nope. Okay. You you have an account at Merrill Lynch, so I'm wondering, do you have a broker there? Well, I have a brokerage account there too, uh, another account, and that's that's all stocks. Mm-hmm. How much is in that brokerage account? I think the last time I looked, it was about two hundred and twenty-four thousand. Mm-hmm. And so, but at T Rowe and Fidelity, that's all retirement assets. Do you also have a brokerage accounts there? That I'm not sure, Jill. Okay. I mean, look, you got a bunch of money. It's great. I love the idea of consolidating. You know, I'm not a huge fan of uh, a big wirehouse like Merrill Lynch, unless you've got a broker who's really been fantastic. And maybe, you know, there's plenty of uh, guys and gals who are CFPs at these big wirehouses. So they they sort of are like the, the white hats at these organizations. They tend to be much different than sort of the company line. But, you know, look, I, I love T. Rowe Price. I think it's a really well-run organization. They've got tons of really low-cost mutual funds. And, and if you're happy with T. Rowe Price and that was sort of where you got your start and that's comfortable for you, then sure, I'd love to consolidate there. My second choice would be Fidelity. If you're going to continue to maintain that, you know, two hundred twenty grand in the stock account, I'm not sure I'd leave that at Merrill Lynch. I would probably move wherever you decide you want to end up. I would move all of your money there. One account would be a retirement account. The other account would be a brokerage account. Right, and and right. so that brokerage account, um, unless you're getting, I mean, well, I don't know, they're probably old legacy stocks. But unless you're doing a lot of trading, 
you know, you can park it anywhere. If you're comfortable doing this yourself, you really want to be in a T row or a fidelity environment because the whole point of doing it yourself is keeping your costs down. If you feel good about that, then I would go ahead and do it. If you feel like you want some help or you really need some guidance when it comes to your retirement because you never retired before, then it's time to talk to an advisor, not a broker, a real advisor. So could I talk to an advisor? I mean, does would T. Rowe Price have some, uh, have an advisor uh, that I can they speak to? Pr- both, I think that both Fidelity and T. Rowe Price probably have a program where they can hook you up with an advisor, a dedicated advisor, which okay. I would I certainly with that mu- much money. And it will be a fraction of the cost of doing it at Merrill Lynch. Or, you know, look, you live in Seattle. You probably have, a this, you know, I imagine a ton of people. Do you have an accountant that you work with? Not really, no. I mean, we could probably find you the names of somebody in the area, but you know, I think that if you if you like the environment of T. Rowe Price or of Fidelity, I would work through those organizations. They will, and 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 be sure that you're going to deal with somebody who's a CFP who has your back. In other words, it's going to put your interests before his or her interests or before the company's interest. Right. And that's, I think, if you can do that, you're probably going to save yourself some money in the process. You'll have this big chunk of money, about a million and a half bucks. You know, the more money you have, the lower the annual fee. So you could do that. Or if you feel like you really do like doing it yourself, then you can consolidate all the money at T. Rowe Price. And then you can go find yourself a fee-only financial advisor uh, at NAPFA, N-A-P-F-A, NAPFA.org. You put in your zip code and and you can pay someone by the hour. You could pay someone a flat fee to do a retirement plan for you and then you execute the plan. And there's plenty of people who would love to do that for someone like you because you're in like the category of like, hey, there is there is some planning to do and there's also some assets. And it's up to you whether you think you're up to the task of implementing. If you're comfortable doing it, great. If you're not comfortable with it, that's also great. But I really want to be sure that if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, that you're dealing with somebody who is putting you first. That's the key. That's the key here. So um, so I would say do a little research. Give us a holler back if you need some help and you've got some pricing. And and check out NAPFA because I do think that they do some – they've got – the advisors there are are people who basically have very – Uh, big commitments to the planning process. They also are folks who cannot take a commission. So you're not going to have someone that's going to sell you a variable annuity who's a NAPFA advisor, which I think is sort of the danger warning sign, it, you know, as you go forth. Uh, So Jeff, I wish you the very best of luck. Let us know if we can help you out. If you're listening, it's, and you're also near retirement and you need some help, This is the time to do it, to really be sober in your analysis also, though, about can you do this yourself or not? I think that that's an important question to ask. You are listening to Jill on Money. And if you were asking that question or many other questions, just give us a holler. We might be able to walk you through it. Send an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. While we're off on the break... Why don't you go to jillonmoney.com? That is our website, and you can pre order my new book. Comes out in February The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. We'll be right back. Four hundred one Ks, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we would love to chat with you here live from the Capital One Bank Studios in New York. Hey, Mark, the squishy thing on my mic is gone. Does it matter? Does my voice sound different? I think it sounds all right. A little froggy, tiny bit, a little overtired. Mark said I looked like I was at an all-night rave, which is only funny if you know that, A, I've never been to a rave, B, the only reason I stay up overnight is because I'm worried about something. In fact, one time I was in the south of France years ago, and I was getting up early to uh, go out sightseeing, and we're going to go to the some museum, right? And we're walking out of the hotel, and all the people are rolling in after their whole night out, and we were laughing so hard. I said, oh, my God, they're coming in. 
It's nine o'clock in the morning. We're rolling out. That's how we roll, Mark. So if you've got a financial question, the easiest way to get in touch with us is to send an email. The email address here is askjill at jillonmoney.com. You can always go to our website. It's just jillonmoney.com. You can sign up for our free newsletter there. So great. Weekly newsletter. Looking good, Mark. I think it looks awesome, don't you? You can also uh, pre-order a copy of the book. The dumb things smart people do with their money. I used some of your your stuff, you guys. Some of the things you called in about. And uh, we're going to start doing more around that book because we want to start doing some polling, want to talk to you, hear more about what's going on. Today, we have John who is on the line. Where is John calling from? John is on the line from Virginia. Welcome to the program, John. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Thanks, Jill. I appreciate you taking my call. Sure. Uh, here's my here's my question, and, and then I'll give you a little background as well. Um, I, I, the ultimate question is, what would the, the final item or two be on your retirement planning bucket list if you were in my situation? Okay, that's that's kind of what I'm trying to decide. Okay, so tell us your situation. Uh, sure. I, I am married. I'm in my early 50s, I'm self-employed, and a project I'm working on should wrap up in the next two or three years, somewhere around there. And then I'd like to make that my final project as well. Um, Our portfolio uh, is well diversified. We use low cost index funds. Um, The initial withdrawal rate two or three years from now uh, would be under 3%. And once Social Security started sometime after that, it would probably go down to about one and a half percent. We've got about three years worth of cash uh, set aside, three years worth of expenses uh, set aside already. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have any debt of any kind. And our kids are grown, so there's no more college stuff coming. And we're investing about 20% of my current income for retirement. Oh, this sounds like a good story. I'm really, this is fabulous. Well, yeah, you know, I'm trying to, ch- to check all those boxes that everybody says you need to before you head to retirement. Mm-hmm. So, no, this is uh, great. Yeah. So after taxes and tithing, we expect to have um, hopefully somewhere between 100000 and 150000 in cash generated over the last several years of this project. That's that's over the 20 percent of my income that we're currently saving. Got it. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we use those dollars should they materialize over the next several years to plug any holes, uh, financial holes that we have. Um, or that you may see uh, that we have. A few of the options that my wife and I have talked about, more brainstorming than it is leaning one way or the other. Um, But we thought about what we could add to liquidity by just increasing our cash. Mm. Um, We could just shove it into our current investment portfolio and allocate it like we've been doing already. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have any sort of pension being self-employed, so we've, we've... talked about the idea of some sort of deferred sing- single premium joint life annuity mm-hmm. type mm-hmm. of thing. Uh, we also don't have long-term care coverage. We're kind of on that bubble. Do we just self-insure or do we want to do something like maybe a link benefit annuity kind of product yep. or maybe something else? Okay. So, so big picture. So, okay, I got it. So if you um, total net worth right now, let me just get the three um, big pieces of of information here. Your qualified or retirement assets. How much money is in that bucket? Um, low seven figures. I'd have to kind of leave it generic if I could. <laughs> All right. So you got. Look, I'm going to just get, go for it. Million bucks in qualified, non qualified. The cash you need. What do you have? A few hundred thousand dollars. That's like that's your few years that you said. Um. Well. If you if you add the cash plus we have some non qualified investments mm-hmm. that we put in our retirement portfolio or we consider it part of it even though it's not in a retirement account. I got it. That if you put those two together, that th- those two would would also be low seven figures. Okay, so million bucks qualified, million bucks non qualified, perfect. And okay. houses you own outright, and it's worth a ballpark. Uh, uh, half a million. Okay, and no second residence. No. Okay. Any desire to have a second residence? Uh, not to own it. I don't mind renting them for a week, but I don't think I want to own one. I got it. Love that. Um, 
And so now you say that after you've put the the 20 percent or so away, you know, essentially, if you look at the next two to three years, you're looking at your two million probably growing to somewhere around two point three, even if, if you got no growth, like the market went down, the market came back up. If you were just like stayed still with your two million, you're probably going to add another 300 grand to these accounts, maybe a little more um, by the time you actually say I am retired. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair. OK, so. um so let me go backwards in your questioning. Number one, I think you're totally fine to self-insure on long-term care. I think it's a tough it's a tough uh, product to buy right now. I mm-hmm. just wrote an article about this because all of these guys are just hiking premiums like crazy. It, you you may be better off just self-insuring. You've got the money to do it. It is um, you know unlikely that you both will need all of this money to pay for long-term care. So I'm going into the self-insured part on that. Okay. Next, next drill down. Um, should you buy any sort of strange annuity insurance company blended product? No, I would not do that. Again, I don't see why. You already have run the numbers. You know what you can take out of this portfolio. You don't need the insurance company to take your money, hang on to it, and then parcel it out to you over time, which is essentially what those products will do. So I don't think you need that. Now, the money question, what do you do with that money? I would tilt toward, I, I presume, you, are you in the highest tax bracket? Uh, for the next several years, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I probably would take the money that I have that is in, you know, pay that highest tax bracket. I'd add it to your non-qualified account. As you said, when you turn 70, um, you you are going to be able to basically delay pulling money out of those qualified accounts, you know, until you have to, until you have that requirement. And it's nice to have a little bit of a nest egg. And I'm not sure because you got a million bucks, it's in qualified money. You're going to end up being in a pretty, you're probably going to be in a pretty high tax bracket anyway, because of what's likely to occur. So I'm just as happy with you paying your tax that's due now, adding to your non-qualified account, I call this the KISS plan for you, John, for you and your wife. And the KISS is keep it simple, stupid. You've done a fantastic job. There's no reason to start buying products that are going to cause you to pay more. And I think that the the straight path forward is exactly what you've done. Put your money in your retirement accounts. Put your money in your non-retirement accounts. I love that it's split about equal. If anything, I like to tilt towards building up those non-qualified assets a bit because, you know, again, if something bad were to happen, I'd rather have money that's already been taxed. You know what that is. And if tax rates rise in the future, which they probably will, you know, eventually, you've already paid the money. So I think you're fantastic. So your final retirement planning goal before leaving work don't blow it. Don't take too much risk. Be careful. Keep adding and keep your head down. Do the things that you know you like to do and don't pay for products you don't need. Thanks so much for calling. Good call. Another well-planned client. Fantastic. If you've got a question like John and his wife, you can send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Check out our other publications just go to jillonmoney.com you can read you can listen you can watch and of course sign up for that free weekly newsletter mark works on it so hard twitter instagram facebook youtube she's all over the place go to jillonmoney.com to find it all now back to the show with jill schlesinger You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. Hey, check out our Facebook page. Mark, it's changed over, I think. It's all done. So all sorts of fun things are happening. What is the Facebook page called? Jill Schlesinger? Or is it Jill on Money? We're trying. I'm hopeful it's Jill on Money by now, but it could be Jill Schlesinger, which is a mouthful. I'm sorry. If you've got a financial question, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. You can read, you can listen, you can watch, you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter, and you can also pre-order the book. Book's coming out just a couple of months. First week of February, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. 
It would make a lovely Christmas gift, except that it's pre-ordered and it won't be ready. <laughs> but be that as it may, maybe it's a, a nice thing to get for uh, the, the new year. Keep your money on track. Anyway, you can always send us an email. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. And uh, or if you're just on the website, just click the contact us button. Dwayne had written us and his uh, subject was early retirement. He first wrote, would love to know how I'm doing and want to speed up my retirement journey. I'm getting married and not sure what direction to move to move towards savings or more real estate investments. And then he followed up with more info. So he makes Let's just, I'm going to round it up. $62,000. He gets rental income of thirty grand from five rental properties. That's like a full-time job, you know? Two of the five actually don't have mortgages. His investments, he's got $72,000 in his 401k. He is currently contributing 6% with a 6% match. $18,000 in a Roth IRA that he maxed last year. Future wife, 56 grand in income, 85 grand in her 401k. And uh, she does the exact same thing, 6% contribution with a 6% match. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a romance at work. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, there's some money, uh, there's some debt uh, mortgages on the rental properties. Three of the properties have a mortgage outstanding, one is at six and a half, but it's not a lot. It's 22 grand. You didn't tell me how much the actual real estate is worth, but it, it's okay. But anyway, 22 grand at six and a half percent, 25 grand at six and a half percent, and the third rental, 61,000 at five and a half percent. Primary residence. It's worth $260,000, $210,000 mortgage at 4.375%. No credit card debt, but, uh, or sorry, credit card debt, but it's a 0% interest. It's going to be paid off. Good. After we pay off our credit card debt, we want to build our cash reserves and increase our investments. Not sure where we should put our cash. Um, I think you're all set with the rentals. That's plenty of money, okay? You've got plenty of money tied up in your rentals. What you don't appear to have, you didn't. maybe you didn't mention it, but I'd love to see if you have an emergency reserve fund for the two of you. That would be interesting to build up something like 6 to 12 months of your living expenses in a safe place. That would be a great idea. Uh, the other idea potentially would be that um, you take more money and put it into your 401k. So increase your contribution. That could be, I, I presume that you're re- you're maxing out your Roth. Um, maybe for your wife, she also would ro- uh, max out a Roth. I don't think she has one. So those are, I think, a couple of ideas. Um, in general... I like the idea when you're young and you're making this kind of money that you're, you are using a Roth. But when you have extra money, I am not sure why, you know, I don't think you need to add to your other um, non-liquid assets, your real estate investments. And, you know, if you were maybe a little bit older, I'd start, I, I would consider paying down those mortgages, but I wouldn't necessarily go crazy with it. And the reason is that, hey, look, that's deductible, right? That's that, That's how those... It's essentially how those work, right? You, you, you want to have a mortgage. That said, um, I don't know. You've already paid some down, so I'm not sure whether or not you're going to listen to this. But anyway, good luck. Let us know if you've got more questions. Let's see. Joe writes, I have approximately $250,000 in a Roth account, but I've been hearing conflicting opinions as to the future of the Roth. One prominent financial show is actually advising people not to invest in a Roth as a future Congress could change the tax rules entirely. My question is this. Do you believe for people who currently have Roths that they will be grandfathered in on withdrawing funds tax free regardless of possible changes enacted by Congress? Yes, I do think so. Um, I think the Roth is still just an unbelievable, wonderful vehicle. I think it would be in when you look at tax law and how it's changed over time, what we have often seen is that 
most changes are grandfathered in. Let's let's look at the last, just the most recent tax law from a year ago, right? Little, we have tax laws that change, right? And for example, the mortgage interest deduction changed. But if you had a mortgage that was predating December something, I think it was December 16th or something, that you were grandfathered in. And I think that that's exactly what would happen in the case of a Roth, because it's just it would be awfully hard to change the rules. Most of the rules changes that occur in tax law are not looking back. They are a moment in time and going forward. So I think you're OK. I really do. And I think that um, I would keep using it. And I don't know which prominent person is saying that, but I think it uh, doesn't make sense to me. It, I mean, it doesn't make sense in, because it's just not the way tax laws have worked in the past. So I say go forth, use your Roth. I wouldn't worry about it. And um, there's so many other things to worry about. <laughs> That's not one I'd worry about. So do follow up with us, though. I'm wondering, who who do you think, Mark? Who do you think is saying no to the Roth? I bet somebody who wants to, what is it? They want to do something. They want to sell you an annuity instead? I'm guessing. Anyway, you're listening to Jill on Money, a prominent national talk show. <laughs> I'm just quoting that guy. We're not really, I mean, I think we are-ish. We did win a Gracie Award for the best national talk show, so that was good. Anyway, give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you have a financial question, we would love, love to hear from you. Lots of ways to get in touch with us. Two simple approaches. One, send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Two, go to our website, which should be bookmarked. Is it not bookmarked? It should be jillonmoney.com. And if you just open that up or maybe just make sure that it opens every single day. I'm just kidding. I don't know what you open to. But anyway, if you bookmark it, what's great is that you can see there's a contact us button top right. So it's right there. So ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com or the website JillOnMoney.com. Uh, let's see. Here is a message, a note from Marie, who listens to our radio program um, in Illinois. But she's going to be in Arizona for the next seven months. Poor her. Hmm. Yeah, I would leave Illinois also. If to go to Arizona or any northern destination. <laughs> anyway, just wondering what your opinion is uh, about investing in preferred stocks. We're 74 and 83. I know you cannot say for us in particular, since you don't know our financial picture, but what do you think of preferred stocks in general? I like preferred stocks. Next. All right, just kidding. Um, so preferred stocks occupy an interesting position. It's somewhere between a bond and a stock. And, you know, when I think about a preferred stock, I think that what people use preferred stocks for is part of their income producing portfolio. And what I'm wondering from for about your particular situation, Marie, is are you trying to drive income? And if so, do you consider this part of a overall strategy to create income from your portfolio? And, you know, the thing about a preferred stock that even though it is, it sort of looks like a stock, it comes behind the bondholder if there's liquidation, but it does have a stated dividend with a, with, with a promise. So in general, I like the idea of dividends. They're great. In particular, it really depends on what you're using this for. And preferred stocks and preferred stock funds could be great. You can create lots of income, but something goes wrong. If, are you buying a fund? Are you buying individual preferred stocks? Things can go wrong. 
interest rates can change. Your something your 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 consistent income can actually disappear rather quickly when you are not paying attention. So I really would want to know more about your whole situation, Marie, before starting to have a conversation about preferred stocks with you. So you can follow up with us, which we're, we always love when you do that. Madeline writes, ready for this? When is, the, is it the right time to buy a house? Oh, Madeline, this is a big question. Um, I love buying homes. Uh, it's, it can be great. But I don't like it when people buy homes with low with sort of these low down payment loans because I think that it can it can beg for a problem. I think that for many people buying a home can be this natural extension of where you are in your life. But hey, I like renting for a lot of people. I think renting can be a really good way for people to leave their options open. So when I think about buying a home, I think, number one, first and foremost, run the numbers. What do I mean by that? Well, it means that I need you to take a good look at what your costs are right now. Look at the, look at the money you're spending on rent and then determine what kind of home you would actually want to buy and whether or not you can afford it. There are a lot of calculators out there. One that I like is this great calculator from the New York Times. It's a rent versus buy calculator. And uh, it goes up, I think it's like goes up to a purchase price of like a million bucks. But it helps you look at your particular area and determine what the cost of ownership might be. And what you really want to look at is the total cost of owning a home. What do I mean by that? Well, there's principal and there's interest on your mortgage. There's taxes. There's homeowner's insurance. And then there's the ongoing maintenance. And that can be anywhere from 1% to 3%, maybe up to 5%, depending on what kind of house you're buying, of the purchase price every year. Trust me, something's going to go wrong. So can you afford all of that? Is that something that's in your – is that possible? Are you relying on putting very little money down and having a mortgage that would maybe be slightly riskier? I like 20% down. It's boring because it works. What is it that you want to preserve in terms of your flexibility where you live? Do you want to leave yourself open to maybe finding a job somewhere else? Are you looking to perhaps stick around for the long term? All these are really important questions. Hey, Mark, you know what we should do is let's put a link to, uh, do we have the Elise link, what uh, homeowners need to know? What every, like the first hundred things first time home buyers need to know. Let's put a link to that on. Um, and for those of you who own homes and you're looking to move up or move down, check out the Resource Center on our website, jillonmoney.com. We've got a really cool link to a website called homeownering.com. You can see how much equity you have and what's going on for you. So good luck. Thanks for writing us, Madeline. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. You can just go on to jillonmoney.com. Click the Contact Us button. While you're there, sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. Hey, uh... Have you subscribed to our podcast, The Better Off Podcast? Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. Check it out. Slightly different than the radio show. You know, it's some, same, same hostess. Uh, before we finish out the hour, Jerome has a question. We have way too many different accounts, stockbrokers, bank accounts, mutual funds, IRAs, individual stocks. What's the best way to consolidate some of these accounts so we can receive just one or two reports a month or quarter instead of more than 20? We enjoy your show and we cherish your advice. Oh, that's so nice. All right, let's divide it up. There's two types of accounts, retirement and non-retirement. 
you can actually go to a brokerage firm, a discount brokerage firm, like a Charles Schwab, like a TD Ameritrade, like Fidelity, like Vanguard, T. Rowe Price. They all have brokerage account options. And you open up an account and it's like, think of it as like a a bag that's going to hold your non-retirement assets. And then you can do the exact same thing, a brokerage account for your retirement assets. And then you have to go through the exhausting process of transferring everything in. But I will say that it's kind of easy if you work with the place where the money is going eventually. So that's uh, an easy way to do it. It is um, important that you probably have some banking relationship. Now, that banking relationship can be an online bank. That's not a problem. You probably get higher interest. But if you actually want to have a bank, a local bank account where you can actually walk into a branch and pull money out, then you may want to stick around and have enough money in that bank to, uh, you know, get you where you need to go. So that's it. Go consolidate. It'll make your life so much easier. Okay, that's it. That's hour number one. Oh, I can't wait for hour two. Here's what I'm going to do during the break. I'm going to go get something to eat. Here's what you should do during the break. Go to JillOnMoney.com. And you can there find all sorts of fun content to listen, watch, read. You can even pre-order my new book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. And it is out in February, just around the corner. Okay, we'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's our number two of the Thanksgiving show, Jill on Money. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Bank Studios. And thanks so much for listening. So happy to have you guys. And we are uh, in the midst of craziness. We have uncertainty. And what do we need to know? We need to know what are all the risks that exist out there. Now, you know, when you talk to economists, what they're very concerned about is what's happening in China. They're very worried about how the Chinese deal with this overhang of debt. They don't know what's going to happen. So we thought we would broadcast a fantastic interview with the two men behind a movie out called The China Hustle. Dan David, a short seller, and Jed Rothstein, a movie guy, got together and were telling the story of what is going on in China and how many investors may not realize just how dangerous investing in the country might be. So here is our interview with Dan David and Jed Rothstein. Where did the idea for this film begin? Jed, did, did you did you hear about this guy named Dan? Did someone come to you with this concept that something weird is going on with people who are investing in Chinese companies? Yeah, one of the producers knew um, John Carnes, who's also in the film, another short seller and investor. She through John, met Dan, and brought the film to uh, Jigsaw, which is where I've done a lot of work, um, to in hopes that Alex Gibney would take it on, because he's the sort of master of um, financial films. He did the Enron movie, The Smartest Guys in the Room. He also did that crazy Scientology movie. Exactly. Oof. And um, Alex really loved the story, but he couldn't direct it because he was already committed to some other stuff, but wanted to executive produce it and said, let's see if we can connect Sarah, who is the producer, and Dan with um, one of the other directors in our shop, which turned out to be me. And then the idea for the film and the genesis of the storytelling really began just as I describe it in the movie itself, which is Dan and I met in a TGIF in Penn Station. Mm-hmm. That's and so romantic. It's so your first yeah. date at TGIF. That's really a bad story beginning. You know, Penn Station, I've been going in and out of it for over 20 years and it just never gets 
never gets better. No. Uh, obviously, we're giving up the ha- the ability for TGI Fridays to ever sponsor us right now by throwing them under the bus. It was wonderful. You know what? I, I salute everyone who, who toils there. You, they're trying to make it work in Penn Station. Mm. It's, a, it's a tough spot. It really is. It's a tough spot. So, okay. So, Dan, you are a hedge fund manager. I am. And talk a little bit about how you got involved with investing in China in the first place. Well, so we were investors in the classic sense of the term of value investors and um, had done well in the mid-2000s running up to 2008. Uh, 2008, as you may have heard, was a tough year. Yeah, it's weird. I, 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 it does yeah. strike me as one of those, hmm, why does yeah. that sound familiar? Yeah, I, it, was, it, was, it was a good couple years running into that, and we we're flat running into September of 2008. And by flat Nove- meaning what? Like you had no positions on? No, we, we, we were even for oh, the even year. Oh, even for the year. We were, okay. you know, we were up 50% the year before and 50% the year before that and doing well. 2008, it was just really choppy going into September, but we, we managed to stay flat mm-hmm. uh, as far as not up or down. But by November, we were down 79%. 7-9. 7-9. Wow. Yeah. So you had a hedge fund, and was it filled with a whole bunch of institutional people, or were they just rich people who had extra money who bet well, on you? Well, at that time, it was my partner's hedge fund, and he's a really unsung hero in in this story, Maj Swedan. Uh, there's There was two of us, and... There's there's a whole team behind what I did. I could arguably say I'm the least important part of that team. For one reason or another, I end up in the movie. Uh, and, and it was his fund at the time. And I ran the venture capital part of our business as well as some of the real estate interests. So it, it was a soul-crushing experience for him. And, you know, he, he came to stay with me for a couple of weeks. And I said, okay, tell me about your side of the business now because I'm now going to have a part in everything we do, including your side of the business. And he explained to me about value investing. And I basically said, look, we shouldn't change anything about what we do because it worked for you for 20 years. And let's stick with this model. Let's let's consider these last two months an anomaly in the market, and it was, and go back to value. And when we looked at value in 2009, almost everything was in China. A China-based company listed on our U.S. exchanges. So we thought, like anybody else, if it's listed on our exchange, they're, you know, regulated by the SEC. The exchanges do their diligence. The investment banks do their diligence. They have a big four auditor. We had no reason to suspect anything. And we invested almost everything into these China-based companies long uh, and picked up 229% in 2009. Whoa. Okay. And so how did you get information? Because um, notably, the... The Chinese market itself is sort of opaque. The fact that it was had a U.S. listing, you yeah. uh, presume that you know it sort of has compliance hurdles that it's been reached. But if I wanted to buy a Chinese company, I am precluded from doing that. I can't go invest in a Chinese-based company from the Chinese uh, market because they have the A and the B, and and it's really hard to invest overseas. So your idea was if it's here, right. it's kind of cleared this right. regulatory hurdle, and Correct. at least we know that kind of maybe not be the best investment, but at least it's not, uh, you know, some fly-by-night crazy, you know, Joe's, no, I, Joe's I, investing. We we felt it was the best investment. And we, we did the same due diligence at that time that we would do on any U.S. listed company based in the, in the United States. Uh, so we interviewed CEOs, CFOs. We, we talked to competitors. We channel checked and things of this nature. The difference being to clear these regulatory hurdles here in the United States, it's really about filling out paperwork. And it's really about, you know, having your legal team and your auditors who are just checking paperwork. They're not actually developing the audit. You turn in the numbers and they look at them. And remember that just in in speaking to, like we just mentioned Enron very briefly, Jed, that like you would imagine that if you are telling this story and you say, hey, look, it's a listed company. Right. Was it surprising to you to learn how, in fact, these companies became listed in the United States? Honestly, when I began this, I didn't really understand the concept that dozens or hundreds eventually of Chinese companies could be listed on U.S. exchanges. And so it was really eye-opening um, to see the mechanics of that, which are quite complicated. Um, it was also interesting to 
to see how the we're really living in a 21st century economy where capital can flow across borders instantly. Uh, but what I found in making the film is that the regulatory framework and the rules of the game of capitalism that are supposed to keep it fair and transparent are kind of stuck in the 20th century. And to me, that's a sort of big takeaway from this uh, this whole story. It's less about the specifics of what happened in this set of frauds and problematic companies and more about what kind of system do we want to have. If we want to have uh, a global market, which I think is probably good and probably inevitable, we should really think about policing it in a way so that it uh, we're, we can be reasonably sure that what we're looking at is w- what it claims to be. We'll get back to the guys behind the China hustle. In the meantime, if you've got some questions that need answering, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money. It is Thanksgiving weekend. You may be out and about. You may be licking your wounds after your tech stocks or your Bitcoin have dropped dramatically. Mark sat on that loser for a long time. You're going to ride that down to zero? You're going to wait till you have some gains to wash against it? Take the losses. Three grand against ordinary income, man. How much have you lost so far on it? Half of it. What did you put in? Five? Oh, my God. I can't believe what a donkey you are. I would take that loss and use it against your income because, uh, yeah, you'll be very happy you did. Anyway, have you done any of your tax selling yet? It's getting to be that time of year. Come on. If you need some help, you want us to hold your hand, you want us to uh, you want to jump off the ledge with Mark, uh, we would love to hear from you. Give us a shout. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Don't forget, you can go onto the website right this minute and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We work hard on that, and it's a beautiful new design. My sister commented, she's like, oh, it looks so pretty. Tell Mark he did a great job. I said I did. I told him he did a great job. Um, And uh, that free newsletter, it's just chock full of good stuff. All right? So check it out. JillOnMoney.com. Free newsletter. It's all yours. Let's get back to our interview with Dan David and Jed Rothstein. We're talking about how the Chinese securities industry has figured out a way to sidestep U.S. regulations. Here's more of our interview with the men behind the China Hustle movie. The interesting thing, Dan, is that when we look at how those companies were able to kind of use their own sidestep regulators in general, was the, the premise was, let's find some shell company in uh. the U.S., this company had already been a public company, right. but it really didn't have any assets anymore. And right. let's do, did they do a reverse merger? Is that how they did it? In many cases. Some of them were IPOs, uh, but in many cases, it's a much, it costs a lot less to reverse merge into a company. And, and in, in all fairness, Berkshire Hathaway is a reverse merger. I mean, so it can go fine. Uh, but in, in these cases, you spend anywhere from one hundred to three hundred thousand dollars on a what they would call a clean shell, which means it has no litigation attached to that old former company, and you reverse merge your company into it, and you don't have as many of the audit hurdles uh, or regulatory hurdles that you would have in an IPO. And as a result, when you are looking, when you as, as an investment advisor or, or a chief investment officer of a hedge fund or a yeah. private equity firm, you're looking at it, you say, here's the filings, right. here's the numbers. Right. You don't know whether or not these are complete baloney or not. Right. I mean, because they've been filed. Right. You, I presume, started from the premise like these are the numbers. Well, I start from the premise that the you take these numbers at face value, uh, especially when they're when they're not guidance or outlook, these are these are actual empirical numbers of what they say they did in the past, and and you work backwards into if they're lying, there are repercussions. Uh, people from Enron and WorldCom, Tyco, they went to jail. That doesn't happen so much anymore, but that's a whole another segment. Uh, and and then you you find out that it's not illegal in China to steal from an American citizen. 
No, I think that's a point of pride. I could point to a case where Ming Zhao from Puta Coal stole $450 million from U.S. investors. Uh, we exposed that. And a year later, he was appointed to provincial Congress. Oh, my God. So you're not elected to Congress there, right? You're appointed. So they'll they'll literally pin a medal on you for stealing a half a billion dollars for U.S. investors. So let's go back. You go 2009. You make 200. So you didn't go out of business in 2008. So that was good. Yeah. 2009, you make 229 percent. And then what? what's the next part of this? I mean, you've, you're yeah. killing it. Well, there were critics like uh, Carson Block from Muddy Waters and Alfred Little. Uh, who's John Carnes, uh, that were saying a lot of companies that we had invested in and maybe we had gotten out of these companies because they had a price target, not because we thought they were fraudulent, but because we bought it at nine and sold at 28 or whatever it was. They were saying they were frauds. And, and my partner Maj and I got together and we said, look, we were either good at what we do or we were lucky and we need to figure that out or we're going to be out of business. So we hired our own China team to prove the short sellers wrong. And we gave them 30 companies to go look at. And they came back and they said the short sellers are wrong. They're understating the problem. Oh, my God. That's I love the part in the movie where there's a guy who goes up and sort of knocks on the door of the Chinese company and says, hey, I want to give everyone free tea. <laughs> oh, yeah. That'd be so nice. Can I yeah. just bring you some free tea? And you guys had thought how many employees did they just say they had at that point? Uh, they said they had, you know, say maybe hundreds. Fi- yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, look, they had one truck driver with, with yeah, <laughs> the, and forty uh, people, I believe he said. Yeah, oh, we have forty it, people it was here. Something a- like ten x uh, of, of what it was, and there are all kinds of stories that we have that we have to go through. The tea salesman was a good idea at getting an employee count, uh, and and the bravery of some of these China investigators. I mean, they're they're risking jail time. They've been beaten up. They've been run off the road. They've been pistol whipped, things mm. of this nature. So you come to find out that these Chinese companies, some of which had done IPOs in the U.S., some of which had done reverse mergers and are now listed on U.S. exchanges, that they're basically fraudulent endeavors, that they're they're kind of yeah. saying, hey, uh, you know, it's as if it's like the, the Jill Trading Co. from China, right. from Shanghai, is setting up and I do a reverse mer- merger and I... I then what? How do I get people to invest in this fraudulent? Because there's a part of this that's like you got to have a pimp. So mm. who's the pimp in the story? Well, number one, the pimp finds the product. So a Chinese chicken farmer doesn't wake up one day and understand how to defraud the U.S. capital markets. Good point. So people from the United States go there to any kind of B-level operator and say, what could you do with $50 million? Mm. And, and this B-level operator will say, well, my business would be this big. And imagine my, I'm holding my hands way out. And the pimp, as you call them, says to them, look, all you have to do is tell everybody your company's already that big. We'll give you the money, and then you can build it out. Nobody's going to get hurt. And by the way, if you get caught, you did nothing illegal in China. So you can't be prosecuted. And if you get caught in the U.S., then what happens? In other words, if you lie to the mm-hmm. SEC, mm-hmm. what happens? If you're a Chinese person? Uh, nothing. nothing. I mean, that, I mean they, they don't have the ability they to can't. enforce yeah. subpoenas. They, if you come here, um, they can. No, they'll put you on a plane and send you home. Now, here, you go straight to jail. Do not pass go, and you've got to post bail or something of that sort, but no. And the ironic thing is when we catch U.S. people stealing from China investors, like the EB-5 program, which is a pathway to citizenship for Chinese, they've caught, you know, half a billion dollars worth of theft of Chinese citizens. Our government has done the right thing and taken that money back and made the Chinese citizens whole, Mm. which I take exception with. I, I think we should put that money in escrow and say to the government of China, here's what we've taken back from our criminals and we'll make your citizens whole. You do the same. They get the companies, they list, they get them out to the public, and then uh, it's sort of like, it's a little bit like a, a boiler room almost, that like they've got to set up a shop where they can now distribute these ideas and get people to invest in them. So what is the distribution mechanism for these Chinese companies that are pretending to already have the $50 billion? There were there were a, a cadre, a cartel, call it, of deal makers, law firms, 
auditors. And, and really what it became is for the savvy investor or say somebody who took the short side of the sale, you just, you just say, okay, so they have this auditor. Now let's look into, which is somebody we know that has bad companies in the past. Let's look at the bank they use. Okay, that's two strikes. Let's look at the law firm they use. Okay, that's three strikes. And then you develop a profile based upon that. And, and you pretty much know that when they use three or four of these kinds of firms, that there's, there's probably some there there, and you could spend some money looking into them. Okay, we'll get back to this interview with uh, the mavens behind the China Hustle. It's a great movie. you got to check it out. And it'll scare you a little bit, but it'll be good. It's sort of like getting scared straight. If you've got a financial question, we always want to hear from you. Go to JillOnMoney.com and click on the Contact Us button, and we will be in touch. All right, we'll be back in just a second. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money. Uh, Maybe you're listening to us as you are amid the holiday shopping frenzy. If so, hey, don't forget to go out to those stores um, with your information right on your old phone. A couple of the apps that uh, I was looking into to get ready for the holiday season. Shop Savvy, Shopular, and Flip. Be smart. Don't spend too much money either. All right, we want to get back to our interview with Dan David and Jed Rothstein. They are the men behind a movie called The China Hustle. Wait until you hear what happens when Dan David goes to U.S. regulators to try to drop a dime on the Chinese. Listen up. So you start from the long side in 2009. Yeah. You make a bunch of money. You yeah. hire these you, people say, oh, my God, Dan's, you know, these guys are investing. And you go hire these guys. You find out that, in <laughs> fact, it is fraudulent. And mm. and then you start beginning the process of saying, let's now bet against them. No. What happens then? I said, well, we don't want to be short sellers. That's that's not our outlook. We're value investors. Let's not try and learn a new game. Let's go to the investment banks. Let's go to the SEC. Let's go to the exchanges. Let's tell them what we found. And let's see if if maybe they could hire us or somebody like us to do proper diligence so that American investors won't be ripped off. And, and we can just buy good Chinese companies because we still wanted to do that. Uh, and we were just, you know, soundly pushed aside, threatened to be sued and sued uh, by almost any of these entities. Uh, when we're speaking to the exchanges, I mean, it's like, who the hell are you? Uh, also, you are, do, were you treated like, oh, you're not some big white shoe Wall Street dude. You're a guy from Pennsylvania doing We're bullied. What? Yeah. yeah, we were bullied. And, and we didn't take too well to that. Mm-hmm. So we published our first two short reports without taking a position. Interesting. We said, we said look, we'll spend $50,000 buying grave plots in China, proving that this company didn't own the cemetery they said they owned. Uh, and then there was a pharmaceutical company as well. And we said, well, we won't take a short position and the investor community will buy our research. So they'll love us. Uh, so we put that report out and the investor community said, you're short sellers. We don't care if you say you took a position or you didn't. If you're if you're a critic, you're a short seller. Jed. Yes. Who devised the storytelling of how to present what short selling is in the movie? I did. It is brilliant, Thank and I you. want you to. I want that clip, and I want it to go viral. It is the best yeah. explanation ever of short selling well, that I've ever you. seen. I've been doing this for thirty something years. It's brilliant. It's hard to wrap your head around, isn't it? Short. I mean, it took me a while to really myself understand the mechanism, the key mechanism of the borrow, borrowing something and then selling it right away. And I think that that's that's not a natural. Um, transaction. So it really took me a while to understand it and to be able to explain it in a simple enough way. And so right in the middle of the movie, there's this great animation, which is the best ex- explanation ever of short selling, which should be its own animation. And you should basically license it to every investment firm. Which I'll when tell I had... the animator. And I think that the the concept of betting against uh-huh. is always this 
it's a strange feeling because you uh-huh. hear from the investment community, oh, those guys, they're the bad guys, they're short right. sellers. So you also have Jim Chanus in the in the movie, who's a legendary short seller. And I, I thought he also did a good explanation of like, look, this is part of the market. You want both sides represented, right? Right. I, you know, one of our screenings uh, early on, somebody in the audience stood up and said, ah, oh, you shouldn't have short sellers. They're... They shouldn't be allowed in the markets. They just want to bring things down. And my thinking was, well, if you have a market, you have to have the ability to suggest that stocks should go up and also that they should go down. Um, it's not to say that every every short position is justified. I mean, of course, they're not always. But and I they think, don't always work out. Yeah. And there's a huge risk in Oftentimes, being a short seller, yeah. right? I mean, so that's the other oh, part of it. It's a huge risk to short a fraud. Of course. When you're short. You're only going to make money if the market agrees with your thesis at the same time you do. If they agree a year later, you could be out of business. And that happens all the time. They're like, oh, what that guy said last year, it turned out he was right. He's broke. Right. Because he had to hold on to that short. Well, it went up, you know, 10x. But that's what ends up happening. And when you're shorting a fraud, everybody says, well, this company's a complete fraud. You're going to take them to zero. It's easy. A fraud can say anything. You write the research report. You figure you're going to be this great resource to the community. Right. You're going to be like the Sandy Bernstein's of the of, right. of the short China world. Yeah. You're going to do all this stuff. What happened? Well, we just said from then on. Said, look, we're we're, we're just we're just going to embrace it and we're going to short. And uh, one of our first big shorts was um, Sube, uh, which claimed to have 500 employees and they had like 25. And we filmed that. So that's a rounding error. It is. <laughs> And then Puda Cole, which I explained, Ming Zhao stole the money, and and that went that was that was a huge shock to the market. Uh, and from then on, like nobody took myself or Ma seriously until we started crashing billion dollar companies. And and what years? Were and then this the SEC was wanted to talk to us. Well, so let's talk about this. So what what years? So so we now know kind of the progression. What years did you start actively shorting and making money? Two thousand and eleven. Just in 11 or 11, 12-ish? When did oh, they... from 11 on. 11 on. I'm, and then... I'm almost exclusively short now. Why did they want to come talk to you when, when you started making money and crashing companies? Well, because it turned out that we knew what we were doing. And, and, and look, you have to I, – I have to understand that the SEC takes a great amount of calls every day from anywhere from somebody that's intelligent, like you know uh, an investor, to a crackpot. And they don't know who they're talking to. And then, you know, and then when you make a name for yourself, it's still a one-sided conversation. Don't get me wrong. It's not like you go into the SEC and they tell you what they're thinking and you tell them what you're thinking. You tell them what you're thinking, period. And people have often said to me, you know, you meet with the SEC and you give them this time-lapse surveillance and this lock-solid fraud. That must be a great day for them. You've, you've done all their work. So that's a good day for them. A great day for the SEC is when I do all of that, and I've made a mistake too, and they get two cases for one. Right, because while you're here, I might as well look into who you are. Right, and I've never met with them represented by an attorney. Just you alone and your partner? That's right. Wow. Because, and, and believe me, my attorney's not too happy about it. But I said, I'm not paying you $1,000 an hour to tell the truth. If they have a question, I'm going to answer it. I don't need you there for that. Mm. So if you run your business like you're going to be audited tomorrow or you're going to have to speak to the SEC tomorrow, you, know, you, you don't have to rack up all these legal fees. I, I, you know, I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as it is on legal fees fighting you know, frivolous lawsuits. Okay, we will get back to The China Hustle. Great movie. Uh, and the guys behind it in just a second. If you've got a financial question, we would love to hear from you. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com and uh, hop out to the website and you can listen to past shows or maybe if you missed part of this one, you want to go back and listen, go do that anytime. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money going on everyone feeling good feeling good uh you know this could be a pretty major league make or break time for certain retailers you know it's uh pressure's on we know sears they filed for bankruptcy in october i don't know if they're going to come out i was just looking up neiman marcus which has about five billion dollars worth of debt 
much to the dismay of my mother, who loves Neiman Marcus. Uh, J.C. Penney, four billion dollars of debt. It's down. J.C. Penney's down sixty-two percent this year. Hudson's Bay, big uh, conglomerate out of Canada, they own Saks and Lord and Taylor, down thirty-four percent. Barnes and Noble, check out this stat: sales have dropped every year since twenty twelve. It is the Amazon effect, but it's also, you know, they, I feel like there should have been a better game plan. Oh, yeah, I think what happens is that a lot of these companies just cannot, you know, really um, compete with the innovation. Like, even once they see it, they're just not, those are, the people who work at those companies, they're not innovators. They're kind of caretakers. So it really takes a lot to reinvent yourself. Shows you what good management can do to reinvent an old product, right? Or the delivery of that old product. Um, We're going to get back to our interview with the brains behind a movie called The China Hustle. And uh, if you got an investment in anything China-related, you're going to want to listen to this part of the conversation because these guys have identified some pretty big risks that are out there for investors in China. Dan, what's the current risk that is now surrounding these Chinese companies that are people are investing in from the U.S. One trillion dollars. That sounds like a lot. That sounds like another financial crisis. Oh, it's it's. I mean, there's a trillion dollars worth of market cap on our U.S. exchanges. Uh, not to mention how many pension funds that are invested in, say, a Morgan Stanley or or something of that ilk that has a Hong Kong, an Asia fund. In, in the Hong Kong market is, is is a very manipulated market. It's not like the China A share market, which is ridiculous, objectively. But there's a trillion dollar risk, and and systematically, I, you have to hand it to the Chinese for for planning. They really do. They put out a five year plan, but they have a twenty year plan that they don't put out, and and they're very good about updating it and sticking to it. And and what what they saw in two thousand and eight was, wow. Thank goodness we weren't so attached to the U.S. market here in 2008. That could have really taken us down with them. And since 2008, they've said, you know what? Our term is coming. So they've attached themselves to every market in the world over the last 10 years in a very, very big way. If you go back and just look at the last 10 years, the outflow of China capital buying American companies, buying European companies, and investing into other markets will force the rest of the world to pull out of pull China out of any bubble. All right, and it's ten years later. And explain what could happen. G- give me the the doomsday scenario of how we have, uh, you know, financial crisis version two point What happens? Well, I, I mean, China China doesn't just have a bubble. They have bubbles. Uh, they have a real estate bubble. Yeah. Uh, they. Ha- Yep, exactly. They have a debt bubble. Uh, they have, you know, where their debt is concerned, they have credit risks for money lending that is done not through banks. Uh, and it's kind of dark money lending. There are a lot of different kind of bubbles that China could go through, and any one of those could cause them all to pop. And if you have a bubble pop in China previously, years and I guess maybe probably 10 years ago, they had yeah. a bunch of cash and U.S. bonds on hand. And right. you felt like, hey, it's that's the beautiful thing about being a totalitarian slash capitalist state, that you can always basically buy your way out of it. Right. What's the position now of China as, you know, when, when you look at their stockpile of cash and bonds, what could they do to get out of it? Could they? They would. Well, they, they own enough foreign assets now that they could lean on. Europe, the United States, Australia, uh, other parts of greater Asia to to really help them get out. It would be in everybody's best interest for China not to go through the crisis we had in 2008, where in 2008, you could make the case that our crisis supercharged their economy, where China was growing at a exponential rate going into the 2000s. They became the safe haven in 2009, and it really supercharged their economy. So we won't have that ability where if China's bubble bursts, that will 
you know, force everybody to come to the United States, people will quickly, that may happen in the first month, right? Until it sets in that, wow, 30% of this American company is owned by a China firm. And, and I found that in, in the politics that I've gotten into, um, you know, in, in, in running for Congress, I go to speak to some of these companies and they're great. Let's come in. We'd like to give you a tour. And a couple of days later, you hear from the PR person, hey, you're the China guy, right? And I'm like, no, I'm Dan. And, you know, I'm, I'm you know, running for Congress. I don't know I'm the China guy. Yeah, no, you're the China guy. We're going to reschedule. So hmm. I look at that company and I find they had 59 subsidiaries in China. Okay, we will return shortly. We're going to do a little business during the break. Go on to our website and you can read, listen, watch, and you can also pre-order the book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. We will be right back to finish up our interview with the China Hustle Geniuses. You're back with Jill on Money. Before we finish out the program, I want to get back to this last bit of our interview with Dan David and Jed Rothstein. They uh, created this movie called The China Hustle. Uh, Take a listen, and we'll be right back with you at the end of this. China is a huge, freaky, scary unknown. Yeah. Give me another. Well, totalitarian governments uh, that that are, are controlling our media. I mean, China and Russia and and other governments don't allow us to control their media and their internet companies. Like, you can't, by law, control an internet company in China because that's considered media. But they're set up in Silicon Valley right now. They're trying to buy our media companies to control our narratives, to make sure that Democrats hate Republicans and Republicans hate Democrats. We focus on hating each other, and we don't really notice that it's outside influences that are keeping us busy with Mm. all of this nonsense. So, Jed, when you hear... do you? Did this move, making this movie completely freak you out? I mean, let me just say that you you were you made a movie about Al Qaeda terrorists. How does this compare? Well, this is systemically scary mm. uh, because of everything that Dan was just talking about. I'm a little more optimistic when I see guys like Kun, one of the researchers who who went to jail, whose story is in the film, because I think there are a lot of people in China who want to make it a sort of good global citizen and yeah. good financial market citizen. And the, well, yeah, let's, more see, than, let's see what happens now that President Xi is Emperor Xi. They have... Forever. Yeah, that's right. a, as we, as any, hopefully anybody in our country would say that, you know, having a, a leader for life is, is generally a terrible thing. And I, I'm I'm not, I don't want to soft pedal the, the danger of the problems, but I do think there are a lot of people who want to shed light on things and, and, and make... China the best place it can be, because which is important for us, because at the end of the day, we are becoming more integrated, and we have to. And I don't. I think whether or not we desire it, we're going to all be part of this big global market and this big global village. And we might. I'd rather have it be more open, like America, than closed, like these places where there's no free speech and you know the president can be on for life. I try to look at the the half full side of it and see these guys who are who are risking a lot for a better future. Okay, that's it. That is the program. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to Dan, David, and Jed Rothstein for coming in. The movie is called The China Hustle. Required watching for any investor who touches the Chinese market. That may be you. All right, we will see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. During the week, if you've got a question, send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Black Friday. Happy Cyber Monday. Happy Giving Tuesday. We'll talk to you next week.